Hi, and welcome back. I'm Nick, and I help run Camp Zufari here at the Houston Zoo. We're excited to bring the zoo to you with Camp Zufari TV. Today, we're gonna to talk about animal babies and how they're raised in the wild. Whether it's a single parent or both, if the entire family helps out, or if that baby animal is left to learn everything on its own, it's fascinating to see how animals are raised in their native habitat. First, we'll start at our elephant yard and we'll learn about Asian elephant herds in the wild and how the whole family comes together to help protect the babies when they're born. After that, we'll catch a ride with an anteater pup as it gets a piggyback ride from mom. Later, We'll learn from the Houston Zoo's animal and veterinary care teams how they helped hand raise a baby monkey who was too weak to hold on to mom. Last, we'll go for a swim and take to the water as we learn about species like the Houston toad and the different parenting styles of each. I don't know about you guys, but I cannot wait to see all these baby animals. Let's go. Extended families like those seen in our elephant herd consist of a group raising their young. This type of family could include moms and helpers like aunts, cousins, sisters, or brothers. Animals that live in extended family groups benefit because they include lots of protection, good role models, and extra playtime because all of the babies live together. With a large family, there's more protection for newborn elephants from predators. The youngsters in the family will always have plenty of role models to emulate and many times will have several other young elephants their age to play with. Usually there's only one dad and he is often not directly involved but might help protect the large family just like lions do. Elephants travel in herds containing females and babies. There's always a dominant female known as the matriarch that leads the group, but all the females will help the mother to care for and protect the baby. You can see that now with our newest addition, Nelson. This enormous bundle of joy was born on Tuesday, May 12th at 6.30 a.m. to mom Shanti, and he weighed a whopping 326 pounds. Nelson was born in the McNair Asian Elephant Habitat Cow Barn under the watchful eyes of his keepers and veterinary staff. This is the sixth calf for Shanti, who's also mother to Baylor, Duncan, and Joy, who turns three years old on July 12th. Nelson raises the number of elephants in the Houston Zoo herd to 11, five males and six females. Just by visiting the Houston Zoo, you can help save baby elephants and their families in the wild. A portion of each zoo admission and membership goes to protecting an estimated 250 wild elephants in Asia. Since the Houston Zoo started its work in Borneo in 2007, there has been an increase in the wild elephant population. Houston Zoo provides equipment, training, and support for Dr. Farina Othman and her team who are working hard to protect wild elephant families in Borneo. The Houston Zoo purchases trees for people in Borneo to replant in palm oil plantations. These trees create forested paths for wildlife to use. By visiting and supporting the Houston Zoo, Guests are helping the zoo replant more than 300,000 trees in Borneo to save Asian elephants in the wild. Welcome back. Let's check your animal knowledge.
More quizzes to come! Lots of animals are raised only by their mom. They may never meet their dad. Mother and me families consist of just that, the mother and her offspring. This is a typical family structure with solitary animals like bears, most cats, crocodilians, anteaters, armadillos, most marsupials, and some birds. On the evening of March 31st, a baby anteater was born at the Houston Zoo. Baby Tracy can be seen hitching a ride on Mom Olive's back and will continue to do so for nearly a year. Giant anteaters spend the first few weeks of life clinging to their mothers and will typically hitch a ride on Mom's back for almost 12 months. Olive has been very attentive to Tracy, carefully nursing and transporting the pup on her back. Anteaters' unique coloring makes it easy for their babies to hide on their backs. Anteaters have a black stripe that runs from beneath their snout to their mid-torso. The stripe is surrounded by white or cream-colored hair, and when a baby anteater is snuggled on top of mom's back, they practically disappear. While most mammals have baby teeth that eventually fall out and adult teeth grow in, anteaters are special in that they don't have any teeth. They use their long snout and long sticky tongue to slurp their meals by creating a vacuum in their throat, sucking in the insects. Their tongue can measure up to two feet long and use it to eat up to 30,000 ants in a single day. Speaking of dinner, ant eaters feast on ants and termites, but never completely destroy an anthill or termite mound. They leave part of the mound intact so that the ants can rebuild and they can feed there again in the future. How clever is that? In the wild, giant ant eaters face threats resulting from habitat loss and agricultural expansion. The zoo's anteaters serve as ambassadors for their wild counterparts, helping zoo guests understand this unique species. The Houston Zoo is proud to support the Giant Armadillo Conservation Program, a group working to protect giant armadillos and anteaters in South America. Let's check your animal knowledge. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. Are you? There are so many different ways that animals take care of their babies in the wild. And similarly, there are so many different ways we can help save animals. So far this season, we've talked about recycling electronics, creating a sit spot, making wildlife friendly spaces, and recycling and repurposing materials. Today, I thought it'd be fun if we learned how to help take care of baby animals. So to do that, we've traveled to the carpentry shop where we're gonna talk with one of our carpenters, Jack, and he's gonna help us build our own birdhouse. Hi everyone, I'm Jack. I work here at the Houston Zoo in the carpentry shop and today we're going to show you how to build a birdhouse. So first of all, the type of wood we're going to use for the birdhouse is cedar and it's a sustainable wood. It's easy to build with and we're going to have about seven parts to this build itself. So first of all, on this right hand side, left for us, right for you, we're going to have our two sides here. So there are multiple ways of cutting these angles. Um, if you have a parents at home that are helping you, helping you with this project, you can ask them to use some power tools, which will make the process a lot quicker. With this front piece, I've already pre-drilled both holes. The top hole is an inch and a half in diameter, and this is gonna be the access hole for the birdhouse. Underneath, I've actually drilled a one inch hole, and this is going to be for the perch 
which is going to make, be made out of round dowel, which we'll stick in that hole and glue it in. So in the middle, we actually have our back piece of our birdhouse, as Nick is kindly showing. And we have the bottom. And last but not least, we have our roof, okay? So moving on, we're gonna start constructing our birdhouse. Okay. Do, you wanna, do you wanna go ahead and build it, Nick, and I'll talk you through it? Yeah, sounds great. Okay, before you start constructing your birdhouse, of course, we want to use our PPE. So we've got our safety goggles here. We're gonna stick those on to keep our eyes safe. Okay, so we have our right hand piece here and what we're gonna do is put this on edge like that. Would you hold that for me, Nick? Yep. And then we're gonna get our front, our face, with the two holes and we're going to put that on the edge of our side piece. So you wanna keep those really flush and it does help having two pairs of hands whilst doing this. I'll grab that hammer for you. So if I hold this for you, Nick, mm -hmm. and now you have it aligned, you can go ahead and hammer that first nail in. Just like that. Okay, so now we have our front piece fixed to our side. We're gonna grab our other side, put it on edge this way. Line the edges up. And we're gonna grab two more nails. Okay, now it's really starting to come together. So we have our two sides and our front piece assembled. Next up, we're gonna move on to the back piece, which is right here. Okay, and again, you just wanna make sure that the edges are lined up with the side when you nail the back piece on. Okay. Okay, so now we have four pieces all together. We have the main structure. We have the front piece for the two holes. We have one side, a back piece, and the other side. Next up, we're gonna do the base of the birdhouse. So we're gonna turn it up onto the angled edge like that, and we're gonna stick that right at the bottom of the two sides, the front and the back. Again, we're gonna use four nails to assemble this piece. Okay. Very good, okay, so now we have our bottom piece nailed on to the sides, the front and the back. Next up, we're gonna put our roof on. What we're gonna do with the roof, we really wanna make sure that we have more of an overhang on the front side, okay? So that there's a little bit of a cover, almost like a porch for the birds when they actually sit on the perch and go into their hole. Okay, so now we have our roof. So last but not least, we have our little perch that we're gonna glue into this hole that we drilled down here. So we're just gonna go ahead and squirt some glue into the hole. Make sure you get it around the sides as well. Take that off and then if you just go ahead and put that in, it's gonna be a tight fit. There you go. What Nick's doing is he's turning it while he's pushing the, the round dowel into the hole and uh, it's just easing it in. So there we have it. There is our finished birdhouse. Super simple, made from cedar, sustainable wood, and it's gonna help save baby animals in the wild. Now I can set this out at home to help provide a home for those baby birds. Since we're talking about babies, I thought it would also be important to share some information on what you should do if you're out exploring and you come across some baby animals. If you see a baby squirrel or rabbit, the best thing you can do is observe from a distance. If you want to get a closer look, try using the zoom on your camera or a pair of binoculars. And if you watch long enough, you may see mom come back to check on the little ones. Likewise, if you see a baby bird down on the ground, it's okay to pick that bird up and put it back in its nest if you can reach it. It's only a myth that the mom won't take the bird back if it's been touched. If you have a house cat, the best thing you can do if you're letting it go outside is to put a bell on its collar or to only let it go outside when you go out with it. House cats are excellent hunters and fledgling birds make a tasty and easy snack. If you come across an animal and you're unsure if it's injured, the easiest thing to do is to call and ask questions. Texas Parks and Wildlife or your city's animal control are great resources.
all by myself family type is based on instincts and is where the baby is left to figure out how to live on its own. In many cases, these animals never meet their mom or dad. This is very common in most fish, amphibians, and reptiles. It usually involves animals that lay a large number of eggs. Some species will guard or care for their eggs prior to hatching, but not raise their young. Most animals that do not have their parents around already know how to survive. They're born with the skills to find food and avoid predators. They're also born as miniature versions of adults, like baby lizards. They're hatched from eggs and can immediately run to shelter and begin finding food. Another great example is baby sea turtles. Once they're born on a beach, they know how to swim out to sea and can swim as soon as they reach the water. Houston toads are hatched from eggs and grow up to be tadpoles, then tiny toads. They have to fend for themselves immediately after they're born. The Houston toad, such an amazing animal. These guys were once found in lots of counties along the Texas Gulf Coast. Today, they are mostly found in central Texas, in the areas of Bastrop County, with a few populations in Austin County and Colorado and Leon counties as well. The Houston Zoo has a breeding facility for this endangered animal to help increase Houston toad populations in the wild. In 2018, the zoo and its wildlife partners released nearly 1 million Houston toad eggs into Bastrop State Park. The hope is that a majority of those toad eggs will grow to be tadpoles and eventually adult toads to then produce baby toads on their own in the wild. These are toads from the zoo's breeding program. They all hatched in May of 2017. They are quite happy with their five-star digs at the Houston Zoo. They even get crickets delivered by room service. But in the wild, they prefer a sandy soil and pine forest, like those found in Bastrop State Park. You can help save Houston toads in the wild. You and your family can visit the Houston Zoo and Bastrop State Park, where a portion of the entrance fee goes towards conservation efforts and habitat recovery for these totally awesome animals. Welcome back. Let's check your animal knowledge. Keep watching for more quizzes! When babies are raised by both their mom and dad, it's sometimes called co-parenting. Although this type of family structure is found in several different animal species, it is common in many bird groups. This type of family structure has its benefits and downsides. One benefit is that the parents can share the job of finding food and protection. Taking turns allows the parents to take care of themselves, too. In general, Schmidt's red-tailed monkeys are known for their distinctive heart-shaped markings on their nose and are native to Central Africa. The Houston Zoo is home to six red-tailed monkeys, including the new baby. In the early hours of April 10th, a male Schmidt's red-tailed monkey was born to Mom and Jerry. He was named Peter Rabbit in honor of Easter weekend and was hand raised by zookeepers and veterinarians after the baby could no longer hold on to mom. On the morning of his birth, the keepers found Peter in his mom's arms. However, later that day, he appeared weak and fell from mom onto the hay-covered floor. The keeper team and vets suspected Peter wasn't getting enough milk from and Jerry. After a checkup with the vets, they discovered Peter was dehydrated, so they gave him medicine before returning him to his mom. Unfortunately, he quickly developed weakness again and Peter needed to be separated from his mom for care. 
After moving Peter and Jerry to the zoo's veterinary clinic, the animal care specialist bottle fed him with mom nearby in hopes that they could reunite them quickly. During his medical check, the veterinarians discovered that he had a skull defect and took x-rays. These x-rays confirmed baby Peter had a skull fracture. The team decided to continue hand raising the infant so they could monitor his head injury closely. Nowadays, Peter is still under the care of zookeepers and veterinarians. He continues to grow and gain weight and he and his mother regularly meet up close. We hope that they'll be reunited soon to explore their habitat together. Schmidt's red-tailed monkeys are vulnerable to habitat loss and hunting. To help save them in the wild, Houstonians can recycle old cell phones and handheld electronics. Cell phones and other small electronics often contain coltan, a material mined in the parts of Africa that red-tailed monkeys rely on for habitats. Time for another quiz. The natural world is fascinating. Before we leave, I wanted to introduce you guys to another friend of mine. This is Jonah, and though he has spines that look like a hedgehog's, he's not. He's a type of animal known as the Madagascar Lesser Hedgehog Tenric. That's a big mouthful that just says that he's a tenric. And like your pet dogs you may have at home, there are a lot of different types of dogs. There are a lot of different types of tenric. This particular type for Jonah since he is a hedgehog tenric, he's got those spines just like Ernie the porcupine's quills. They help keep him safe as he moves across the forest floor. And to help keep those quills clean, you guys can kind of see he's a little dirty at the moment. Looks like he's been rolling around in the sand and the dirt. That helps keep those quills clean so that he can better take care of himself. Now the most exciting thing about Jonah is he recently became a father. Jonah's had some little babies and I'm here in the children's zoo to meet with Danielle who's going to tell us more about them. All right, so we're here with Danielle in the swap shop and we're about to meet some of Jonah's babies. So Danielle had a couple questions for you. First off, how old are these little ones? Oh, uh, well on Tuesday they actually turned two weeks old. Oh, <laughs> they're adorable. <laughs> no. And how many babies do we have? Um, we have three. Uh, now Tenrex can have up to ten, um, which is a lot, but luckily we only had three. And how do you guys tell them apart? Um, that's a good question. They are very hard to tell apart. Sometimes some are bigger than others, but for us, since they're about all the same size, we were able to put a little bit of paint, non-toxic paint on each one of them. So this little guy here is blue, and he's got a little blue dot. And what other colors do y'all have? We have blue, orange, and yellow. Okay. And when baby Tenrix are born like this, do they have their spines already? They are very soft and um, when they're first born, they still have their spines, but um, as they get much older, the spines start to grow and they get a lot harder um, and more prickly. And what do baby tenrix like this eat? Um, right now they're going to be drinking formula. So they're on a liquid diet for right now. Um, they grow super fast though. So um, within a month, they're going to be eating solid foods and they're going to be doing it all by themselves. Oh, wow. And why are you guys helping to take care of these little ones instead of Jonah? Yeah, so Jonah really doesn't play too much of a part of helping raising them. Um, mom would normally be um, feeding them, but unfortunately mom was unable to. She didn't have enough milk to give all three of them. So that's why, why we stepped in. Um, luckily we were there to, to help them out. Um, and so now we get to feed them. Um, they eat every two hours. Oh wow, so even at night? Even at night, around the clock care for these guys. Um, we recently just got to go to every three hours, um, which was big for them. Uh, but yeah, at first, for the first week, they were eating every two hours, 24 hours a day. And in the children's zoo, you and your team help take care of a lot of different animals. In your opinion, which of those animals makes the cutest baby? Oh, it's kind of tough to beat this. 
But I think I would have to say my other little prickly friend, um, Ernie, was a very, very cute baby, and he is our North American porcupine. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, and thank you, Blue, um, <laughs> for joining us. You guys have a great day. Thank you. Hope you guys had fun this week. Join us next time as we bring the zoo to you. Bye. Hi, I'm Lee Emke, the President and CEO of the Houston Zoo. After more than two months of being closed, we are ready and excited to welcome you back to reconnect with the animals you know and love. To ensure the health and safety of you, your family, and our animals, here are a few of the modifications you can expect during your next visit. The Houston Zoo is now accepting advanced reservations online only for all visitors and zoo members at HoustonZoo.org for the health and safety of our guests, staff, and animals, and to ensure adequate social distancing, a limited number of timed tickets will be available each day and only available online at HoustonZoo.org. Pick the day and time you'd like to visit, and you will receive an electronic ticket that can be scanned by one of our team members when you arrive. Once inside, guests will follow a modified one-way path through the zoo to see many of their favorite animals in outdoor wildlife habitats, including elephants, rhinos, gorillas, lions, and many more. Guests will not have access to indoor animal exhibits or high-touch areas of the zoo. Some sit-down restaurants are open at limited capacity, and food and beverages are available for purchase at multiple locations, all food and beverage locations are credit card only. All zoo staff are required to wear masks while working. And in accordance with new Harris County orders, all guests 10 years and older are required to wear masks. Hand sanitizer stations are positioned at the entrance and exit and along the path, including restrooms and food locations. Zoo staff will disinfect all high-touch surfaces, including vending machines, tables, chairs, and more. For more detailed information and to reserve your ticket, visit HoustonZoo.org.